Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of the Primetime Newscast on Equinox Television, live from our headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, the trial of the national president of the CRM, the Cameroon Renaissance Movement Political Party, Professor Maurice Camto, the allies of the party, other leaders and militants of that political party, which came second in the last presidential election in Cameroon, has been adjourned to October. 8, 2019. They were before judges of the Yaoundé military court earlier today and the court was invaded by a huge number of militants, sympathizers and supporters of the Cameroon Renaissance Movement political party. Also in this newscast, we will take you into the heartbreaking story of some internally displaced persons who are begging for survival. Persons kicked out of their homes in the northwest and south West regions of the country by violence within the context of the deepening anglophone crisis will also show you the horrible situation of schools in Nidabato in the southwest region of Cameroon in this newscast. Stay with us. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on this edition of the news. We begin right away in Cameroon's political capital, Yaoundi, where the trial of Professor Maurice Camto, other leaders of the Cameroon Renaissance Movement, CRM, political uh, party, allies and militants of the party has been adjourned to October 8, 2000. And 19 and the hearing took place today and of course the court was invaded by a huge number of uh, persons including militants sympathizers and supporters of the CRM uh, political uh, party and the court was highly militarized and the case of course was adjourned as I indicated earlier to the 8th of uh, October 2019 details with Ino Senazi. It was an exceptional mobilization of militants, supporters and sympathizers of the Cameroon Renaissance Movement Opposition Political Party around the premises of the Yaoundé Military Court. They came out in their number to witness the trial of Professor Maurice Camto and allies of the party, but were blocked outside by security elements. Some of them say they were already inside the court hall, but were pushed out like dogs by law and other enforcement elements. There yeah, are certain hommes in tenue, certain sergents and certain adjudants who are arrived to ask us to liberate the salles. We are going to go and interject at the exterior. Even when they presented themselves as Cameroonians and not militants of the CRM party, they were still ejected from the courtroom. We have said to the people of the country that we need to be here. Security forces were heavily mobilized at the military tribunal controlling entry, circulation in and around the court premises, and at some junctions in Yaoundé, like Karifu Intendance, was perturbed. On the part of the CRM, the militants, supporters and sympathizers denounced what they qualify as shameful court hearing at the Yaoundé military tribunal. He nous interdit, nous du public, y compris des officiels du parti. That civilians were denied access into the hall that was instead flooded by policemen in civilian way. Nous savons et nous avons vu des hommes en tenue, mais qui étaient en civil cette fois-là, qui ont fait le plein de la salle. Also that persons accused of insurrection are judged without the presence of the public and more so in a military court violating the law. On le juge à huis clos, c'est du huis clos. Et dans un tribunal d'exception, tribunal militaire, ceux qui le jugent seront jugés demain. Despite this frustration as a result of the stiff hindrance by security forces, the CRM militants, supporters and sympathizers remained peaceful, chanting ceaseless liberation songs for their leader, Professor Maurice Camto, and allies of the party. Earlier, Professor Maurice Camto, allies of the CRM political party and the other leaders, uh, had 
put some conditions, uh, notably indicating that they were not going to uh, come to court if the conditions were not met. And among the conditions was uh, that the trial should be opened to the public and the international and national uh, press. And today, the persons, militants, sympathizers and supporters of the CRA and political party who converged around the court area were simply pushed back by forces of law and order. And the court was heavily guarded uh, today and among the persons who were there to witness the trial of the political leaders was the president of the popular action party Jang Dennis who condemned the arrest and of course the manner in which the trial is being handled by the military court take a listen we are all into that fight and we are here to really see into it that um, um, professor Maurice Camto and his allies are released because um, from the onset they were only manifesting their constitutional rights. We, in strongest terms, condemned the barbaric stand by the regime to bring this country into a sham. The country is at the blink of collapse, and we think that the real enemies to this country belong to the BR regime. The international community has condemned this arrest and asked for its immediate release. The national community, we are talking about the civil society, political parties, we have all condemned this arrest, but the regime is bent on going on with their barbaric policy. In line with the lawyers, the lawyers took an action. I also want to remind you that I'm, oh, we are also a member of the Citizens Front, um, in line with other political parties and civil society activists. We supported the lawyers who has begun a strike on the 6th because of the same system that uh, we are all fighting against. And the Secretary of Communication of the Popular Action Party, Lena Fabris, and of course the Secretary of Communication for the Cameroon Renaissance Movement, Rapport Lipod, and other persons who were arrested today during that trial of Professor Maurice Camto, allies and other leaders of the CRM political uh, party, they were arrested and uh, detained, and the reasons for the arrest remains unknown till now. And of course the uh, leaders of those two political parties have been struggling uh, to get their release or to obtain their release now to the southwest region of the country where authorities have continued fighting the oppression ghost town administrative and municipal authorities have been on the ground doing everything possible to ensure that the lockdown imposed by separatist fighters in the two anglophone regions of the country is brought to a halt but this is not yet the case to now as many parts of the two anglophone regions of the country from big cities through towns and villages are deserted and of course the separatist fighters have continued imposing a lockdown as the anglophone crisis deepens further. The governor of the southwest region, Benau Kalia Bilai, was on the ground and of course uh, taking stock of the situation and see what can be done or taking stock of the situation and seeing what can be done to uh, remedy the damaging consequences of the oppression goes down and locked down on the people and their activities. Details with Derek Jato. The Southwest authorities are putting in their best efforts to puncture the two weeks lockdown call of the separatists. Taking the lead, Southwest Governor Bernardo Calabilai since Monday has been using the go on the field and talk courage into the people mechanism. And today, Thursday, September 5, he is going again on the field. His first stop point today was to pay an unannounced visit to some delegations. There, the Southwest Governor knocked some offices, but no one answered. <laughs> He even tried opening the doors, but they were closed. Governor Bernardo Kalia Bilai demanded a roll call and that names of absentees be forwarded to his office immediately. The commander-in-chief of the Southwest region, will later meet Mayor Kema Patrick Esunge, the mayor of the Boya Council on the street, downtown Boya, where the mayor briefed the governor that the open up store strategy is injecting life back to town from checkpoint. Governor Bernard Okalia Bilai took the Bukwai road to Munya village. Today is Thursday and it is the Munya market day. This is the Munya market. 
but it is empty. And the governor of the side must be delicious to see things for himself. Munya, just like my 16, had a twin picture, and the southwest governor took off for Tiku subdivision. Chief Mokondo Daniel Ngande, the mayor of the Tiku Council, welcomed Governor Bernardo Kaliabilai and took him round. What did you tell the governor? He just came here. Yes, I told the governor that uh, uh, at least he has come. He met me in the office for working. So he said, okay, not mayor, I've come. So that we can go make people open their shops. It's okay with the governor. What are you doing? From meeting the bikers at the entrance into the town to supervising that some shops are open in his presence, the Southwest Governor Bernardo Kaliabilai spent much of his time in Tiku subdivision here at the Tiku Men Market, where stores were open and it was business as usual. Analysts say with one of school resumption in the Southwest region has been more of tactics and counter tactics between the separatists and the government with the impact being visible on the ground. Coming up, Sman Jikan Gebri takes us to Idaba to in the southwest region of the country where we're going to show you the horrible and disturbing picture of uh, schools in that part of the country. The students and pupils who are expected in classrooms for the 2019-2020 academic year are facing a plethora of challenges and of course many of them are still in their houses and administrative authorities have been calling calling on the parents to send their children to school to brave the odds, the challenges and of course the unstable socio-political and security situation of these northwest and southwest regions of the country and ensure the education of their children. Smanji Gangebre report. Everybody else, not this the divisional officer for Idabato subdivision, angered by locals of Ndo location, it's more than 10 a.m. and kids who ought to be in school are in a church. This was one of the hurdles met by Iwane Roland A.K., who made a round in his area of jurisdiction to assess the effectiveness of schools in his area. At the Ndo location, the VO gave strict orders to the chief of the village. As they are here and they are disturbing my action, if I see them again around, yes, I'll just be whipping them. They are disturbing my action. Schools have started. On a flying boat accompanied by the elements of the Rapid Intervention Battalion B in the high sea, Ewane Roland AK saw for himself the reality on the ground as most schools are suspended on water with poor structures. For instance, Government Technical College Kombo Amungwa 1. Here, the DO had to move inside water with the lone bridge already off. Added to the poor infrastructural development, Idabato is facing, most of the parents that the divisional officer met complained about the lack of means to send their children to school. The divisional officer ended his visit with the donation of books and didactic materials to pupils and teachers of his area of jurisdiction. Train a child, build a nation. Train a child, build the nation. You are the leaders of tomorrow. And before you become a leader, you must go to school. For those who don't want to go to school, every day I will not stop. I will chase every child who does not go to school. Tell the parents. After one month of chasing those children, I will start putting those children in the cells and their parents. And you children, tell your parents that you want to go to school. They should not send you walking. If I see any child carrying anything to sell, I will keep that thing and throw it away. Even with the effectiveness of classes in Idabato subdivision, the locality is steadily being invaded by water from the sea, which is a threat to be taken very seriously by the government. The administration threatens to send to uh, jail or to in prison 
parents and students who refuse to go to school. Now we're going to talk about internally displaced persons or persons displaced by the Anglophone crisis. The government of the Republic of Cameroon has continuously said it is implementing in full gear its close to 13 billion francs a year humanitarian aid to help persons affected by the Anglophone crisis. And at this moment, there are still many hundreds of thousands who are living in precarious and even deadly conditions in parts of the two Anglophone regions in the littoral in the West and other Francophone parts of the country. Many of them are able to put food on the table. Many of them are able to afford for their basic needs. And we went to one of the families harboring over 10 internally displaced persons in a very tiny and poorly constructed house. And this is the heartbreaking story compiled by Ino Senazi. We are in Lum in the Mungo division of the Litoral region, hosting thousands of internally displaced persons. This makeshift apartment hosts 16 persons from my 16 Boya in the restive southwest region. The arms conflict, which has crippled businesses and agricultural activities, pushed them to loom. Because the things that I brought from my store in Boya, I just packed them in the house and they are only getting expired, I'm throwing them out. They are getting expired, I'm throwing them. And that is the whole capital burning like that. So I'm in loom now, I don't even have something doing. We are now 16. Though in Loom, neighboring the country hit southwest region, life is not rosy. Yeah, too, it's not easy. It's really difficult, you know, leaving your hometown, coming to a land that you don't know anybody, you have not cultivated any crops, you are buying everything, and the money too is not first of all there. You are not doing anything to add income. So the situation is really horrible. It is a new school year, but these children who have been out of school for three years and they're living with their uncles in the bush before abandoning them for loom are yet to resume education. That is really our concern because we came here for them to go to school. They have been in the bush for long. They have not bought any book, we have not sold uniform, nothing, nothing. The money that we had, we just went and registered them. And we are hoping that maybe God will bless us so that they can, we can even buy even two books for each person. Apart from difficulties faced in sending these children to school, feeding is also a major issue. To feed is really difficult for us. It's really difficult because there are times that they eat only one time and they are not full. So it makes the children they are getting sick. If not poorly prepared wise, this family of 16 will turn to the cheapest commodity, Gary. Gary, which is soaked in water without sugar, yet scrambled over by the children. This is consumed at times in the morning, afternoon, and even the subsequent day. To ensure these children, then in number, do not starve just for a day, their fathers who have abandoned their cocoa farms in the southwest region now depend on odd jobs, no matter where they are found. One person came and took them yesterday. They went to one place called Lamba, inside Loom, like that, called Lamba. They go there, they cannot come back today, and that place does not have network, so there are dead three of them. When they work job, they will stay there like for five days. They come back, they give us money, we manage, just like that. Another situation is sleeping comfortably when it is nightfall. This lone light, old and torn mantras is on which the children sleep. This chair is occupied by two adults. A precarious living condition decried by the IDPs themselves, begging governments to address the armed conflicts and assist internally displaced persons wherever they are found. I'm pleading that the government should try and intervene in this matter because we have now become beggars. At first, nobody know. I used to work my money, I feed my children, I even, even cater for the needies. But today I've become somebody that is begging because I can tell them I'm now a beggar. They can even reach us, help, try to help us with food. They keep managing to survive while awaiting hierarchy to engage in a genuine dialogue to end the crisis. So they return to their beloved localities in the northwest and southwest regions. 
more than 16 persons internally displaced by the anglophone crisis living in the same house a poorly constructed house in very difficult conditions and as you saw those children scrambling there that is how it is happening in many homes across different parts of cameroon and in refugee camps in neighboring nigeria where hundreds of thousands of cameroonians are seeking refuge today as a result of the anglophone crisis on to something else now election stakeholders in the republic of cameroon have identified the absence of dialogue as the major stumbling block to efforts to improve on the country's electoral uh, process and this was highlighted during a three-day workshop here in Douala. For me, I'm Strong Sander. Has more. The United Nations fears that the current election-related tension in Cameroon degenerates into a violent conflict. Reasons why the United Nations Peace Building offered to finance ELECAMP's initiative to strengthen dialogue between itself and stakeholders of the electoral process in Cameroon. The electoral process in Cameroon, actors say, is plagued with a lot of irregularities. There are so many things in our electoral code that we have uh, uh, denunciated. The most important thing is, is the actor who are taking part of the election. Dialogue has to be installed so that we should see together what is not going on well and do the proposal so that all of us should have the same point of view. Those problems by extension affect other sectors of national life. We've been able to identify the rules that cause problems, the, the causes of these problems, uh, the actors uh, uh, concerned and how to mitigate. Amidst multiple denunciations from the opposition and within its drive to improve the electoral process, Election Cameroon brought together politicians, civil society actors, media personalities, traditional and religious leaders from the northwest, southwest, west, littoral and the central regions on a three-day dialogue platform in the city of Douala. It's a politics that we're putting in place in elections Cameroon to, because no human action is perfect. So we are trying to put forward a system of participation of give and take so that we see where the text needs to be reached. Participants find it interesting and hope for a positive implementation. Dialogue is a weapon to to arrange from now with the seriousness with the quality of the participant and then during the, talking about the recommendation we hope that uh, political representative political president will not be complaining as last time many actors during these three days recognize the very important role played by the women at the decision taking positions. Elections Cameroon officials say it is in its move for perfection and will continue to dialogue with stakeholders for a perfect electoral process in Cameroon. Of gamblers and uh, suspected Indian hemp smokers as following into the drug net of forces of law and order in Buddha and the west region of the country. Members of the gang are said to be students of government bilingual high school in Buddha. Immaculate Fogwe files in details. We are in one of the local gambling house in Bamisinghe, located in Buddha, Bamutu's division, west region of Cameroon. <laughs> The abandoned building, frequently visited by students of Government Bilingual High School Buddha, has now become a site where these students smoke Indian home, consume sachets of whiskey and gamble. The fight against acts of juvenile delinquencies in Buda is on as a brigade commander Lashile Sebastian, alongside his elements, stomped the abandoned building, apprehended a gang of gamblers. The divisional officer from Buda cautioned the parents of these students on the criminal acts carried out by their children calling on them to effectively play their role as parents by leading or advising their kids to follow the right track. Security agents in Boda say they are bent on adequately addressing the high rate of insecurity in the west region of Cameroon. 
out of country out of the country robert mugabe zimbabwe's first post independence uh, leader has died at the age of 95 and he died after battling with ill health that is information confirmed by family uh, sources and after being ousted from power via a military coup in 2017 his political life was filled with ups and downs as uh, Hemin Iluka reports. Born on the 21st of February 1924 in what was then Rhodesia, Robert Mugabe's political parkour was filled with ups and downs. First a teacher in Ghana, he switched into politics strategically while he criticized the government of Rhodesia. His critiques which led to his imprisonment for more than a decade without trial in 1964. In 1973, while still in prison where he spent eight years, he was chosen as president of the Zimbabwe African National Union, of which he was a founding member. In 1986, Mugabe Yoswo became chair of the Non-Aligned Movement, a position that he retained until 1989. And as a leader of one of the frontline states, the country's bordering apartheid South Africa, he gained credibility within the anti-apartheid movement. After surviving two assassination attempts, would recall that Mugabe officially took his oath of office on the 17th of April 1980. Adding more grace to his political aspirations, in the late 1987, Zimbabwe's parliament amended the constitution which declared Mugabe to be the executive president, a new position that combines the rules of head of state, head of government and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Having reigned as a one-time president of Zimbabwe for decades, Mugabe was only ousted on a military coup in November 2017, and then his three decades reign. Considered as first post-independence leader of Zimbabwe, Mugabe dies at the age of 95 after a period of ill health. Now in sports, the under-23 Lions of the Republic of Cameroon have defeated Tunisia 1-0. The encounter was played earlier today at the Amadou Aijo Stadium in the nation's political captain, Yaoundé. And the lone goal of that encounter was called at the 19th minute of play. That encounter was the away leg of the uh, second round or the eliminatory phase of the under-23 African and Nations Cup bill for for Egypt and the return leg of the encounter will be played on Tuesday in Tunisia. This is where we draw the curtains on this edition of the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Ekinos Television. I've been Babla Jonathan. Thanks for staying with us.